um, just do a brief introduction from those of you guys who have not met. Amy Vecchioni is the head of experiential, experiential learning and emerging technologies and associate professor at Boise State University. See, she teaches in the College of Innovation and Design as well as the Albertsons Library. She's also president of the Idaho Library Association. She helps co-organize and lead the Makerspaces and Libraries virtual tours in addition to all of her other amazing roles. And we are <laughs> excited to have her lead this tour today. So without further ado, Amy. Thank you so much, wheel. Erica. Yep. First, I would like to make sure that you all know that this partner. Oops. Just so you all know, I think I just got a phone call, so I apologize, I just declined. <laughs> this partnership would not be possible without the amazing help of Erica Reidberg, who, so this is a joint partnership between Boise State University and Plymouth State University. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, our makerspace is here on the Boise State campus. There are several similar spaces around campus, but we are the most used space. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, we have a, over 700 different users that utilize our makerspace. Uh, it's a partnership between Albertsons Library and the College of Innovation and Design. Um, and so those 700 active users come from our uh, population of about 25,000 individuals on the campus. Our goal, our vision, is that our campus is creatively confident students, staff, and faculty. We want all of them to be able to make something from start to finish, regardless of the medium whether it's multimedia, video, a web app, a prototype, a sewn dress, whatever it is, we want them to be able to do something from start to finish and then reflect on it. Um, I've had the really good luck of getting to work with an IMLS grant group who is working towards developing maker competencies, a lot like the information literacy standards. And so we like to think of this as something that libraries are supposed to be doing. Um, I'm fortunate to be able to get to work in this area. So let me start by turning around my video camera so that you're not seeing me. It's really, really hard for me. But here we go. So here's the kind of foyer area where our elevators are and our stairs. People tend to kind of stop here and get confused and they look around, they look at the signs and they try to determine where to go from here. And you can see up here on the sign, it says Maker Lab. So we're going to walk through, a lot of us call these the cattle guards. And you'll see the College of Innovation and Design uh, screens that are currently advertising their course listings. Um, they offer all different kinds of innovative courses here at campus. And I partner with them on everything. It's, it's incredibly useful. Um, I, when I agreed to do this in July, I said, yeah, sure. However, we are really under construction. Um, Erica tells me that you all can't hear this sound, but behind this plastic sheeting all around me here is a bunch of grinders. They're ripping up uh, old carpet, and then they are removing the carpet using this bin right here, taking it out, and then they're trying to polish the floor. The floor looks like this. I'm going to get all nice up and close and personal at the floor because I think it's really pretty. It's shiny and it reveals a lot of imperfections and beautiful different colored rock. Um, so this is kind of the College of Innovation and Design's open area. That's Mark, one of my colleagues. And uh, this is where a lot of meetings happen, a lot of events take place, a lot of design thinking happens out here. Students tend to hang out here in this space. It has really great Wi-Fi. It has these dry erase tables, so you can use whiteboard markers on these tables. You can build your own office by dragging around these whiteboard walls. You can use uh, the video equipment and the speaker equipment, and there's plenty of space for building projects. So here's a couple of student projects that they made in the makerspace. It's not currently in its totally finished form. This is a little Mars rover that you use these knobs to drive around. It's in its second prototyping phase. And then this is another thing. Librarians should appreciate this. Some students were designing a stapler um, 
set up so that as you staple things, the staples stay kind of really attached to this, but then it also makes a sound when you press the button or staple something. It's really gratifying. So those are a couple student projects just kind of lying around. And I'm going to show you a peek. We're going to peek around the plastic sheeting. The makerspace was over here just a few short weeks ago. So if you look down at the floor, you'll see the glue that's stuck to the floor that they're grinding off. And then you can kind of look around and you can see there's a guy driving a giant grinder. He's got a tube and it's sucking all the dust up. And then there's another guy that's kind of trying to rip up everything. I don't know if you all can see that. And so what's going in here is it's going to be um, what they call an eSports arena. eSports is the gaming. Um, it's like cheating virtual games, things like League of Legends as actual sports, and they'll be hosting some eSports gaming in that area. Um, they were able to secure a donor to do so. So this whole second floor is transforming. Our space is currently under construction, so we have a temporary location at this time that's going to become permanent, and we're kind of looking at part of it right now. So from here to the wall, you can see the open area of the makerspace. When um, our students who love our space present, they talked about how the most important thing in the makerspace is the couch. So what we have right here is this kind of nice seating that you can see I'm just kind of kicking around. It's really light. And um, you can just push it and configure it however you want to. I think that they actually like it because they enjoy sleeping. But it's also very comfortable. There's also a whiteboard here that they can use. Um, and then as we walk into the space, we have tried to organize the space in such a way so that the things that you need are right there and ready for you to acquire as soon as you, as soon as you enter. So there's some tables, open tables where people can discuss ideas. And then um, there's this little whiteboard that moves around. Welcome to the Maker Lab. Today's motto is start small, start now. Um, with a little tiny thing of our open hours down here. There's our liability waivers. If you don't have liability waivers in your makerspace and you provide things that are either hot or people could pinch their fingers, I recommend that you work with a legal team, whoever may be in charge of your legal team, to try to implement some kind of liability waiver um, so that the people using the space are informed about the potential hazards. Uh, safety is a part of our culture here. We have um, Everybody here that works here is trained so that they know how to interject when someone's doing something that is either um, not physically safe or even psychologically safe, and that includes things like name calling, right? Um, and also things like holding an item that you're trying to drill. So they're trained on how to approach people in a really positive way so they don't run up to somebody and say, no, don't do that. They kind of saddle up next to them and they say, hey, what are you working on? and then start talking to them about better practices. So we have this in place here. We have all of our how-tos and a binder sheet of all of our SOPs. If you're not familiar with what SOPs are, standard operating procedures. There's checklists, safety policies, and little guides about how to safely use the equipment. So that's pretty important. Um, there's some materials here that are for training purposes. So for our 3D printers, these are the kinds of ways that you can have infill done inside of your 3D prints. And if you're not familiar with what that means, we'll come back to that in just a little bit. But those are some of our most used items. And this is our um, little student check-in desk. We have these nice aprons for everybody that's working. The students built and designed these aprons. Um, they made this logo, and then they did iron-on patches, and they put this logo together. They can grab ear protection if they need it, eye protection if they need it. This is something that's really important for all of us. And um, there's checklists here, our maintenance log, and our check daily checklist of what's going on, tools, pens, all kinds of things. Um, this is like our leftover bin of the 3D prints that have been left behind. One of the coolest things here is, uh, this is a gravity hook apparently, can you all see this? So when you drop it, it grabs onto things and then pulls up. 
and I 3D printed this. Apparently, it's really useful. I haven't played with it very much, but I do think it's really fascinating. There's a shoe that's been left behind. 10 million Boise State Bs. These are the most important things we 3D print right here. And this looks like it was a fail. Looks like it was some kind of body on a platform. So these are parts that people just haven't quite picked up yet. And now we're gonna kind of look around. Since we are under construction with the plastic sheeting, all of the equipment has been relocated into this room that's behind me right now. And so what you're looking at, at these open tables, normally would have equipment at all of them. Sewing machines, 3D printers. Dylan, how many 3D printers do we have now? We have 10, I think. 10 right functioning now. 3D printers? 10 functioning 3D printers. We have five in the full swap menus. We have two test sixes, one test five, and then we have a few of these giant hang 3D printers. Oh yeah, here. we're gonna talk about the hang printers. Do you all see this giant plywood thing? This is what's called a hang printer. And um, it's quieter in here. You all apparently can't hear the grinding sound. It is about 100 decibels at least, where I just was, but that glass barrier right here is actually really quite nice. So what I'm gonna do is close the door because I feel like I'm screaming. We're gonna talk a little bit about this hang printer. Um, can you tell us, Dylan, a little um, bit about it? So this was made by one of our Co my coworkers, and it's all ran off of a single Arduino and parts that we found at the reused computer store located here in Boise. But it prints giant objects. It has a two millimeter extruder on it, and this whole frog took about 15 minutes to make. And the idea is that we can print anything that is inside of these triangles. So you could print like a whole stool, and it will hold it. And most of our good demos are packed up, but we have a step stool thing that's about a foot tall that you can stand on and it doesn't flex at all. It uses, instead of um, filament rolls, we use pellets, the actual pellets that go into a hopper and then it churns and extrudes down below. So this is kind of first prototype functions. Um, and then the second prototype is made out of extruded aluminum and it's outside of this room that we're currently in. And we'll come back to that. Thanks, Dylan. Dylan's one of our awesome employees here. Yep, about a year now. He is like great at teaching people how to do things and he's especially good with the soldering and the electronics. So um, when something that is wrong with the 3D printers and it involves the electronic components of some type, I know that I can trust Dylan um, to work on that. We often troubleshoot things together. And he's, yeah. He thinks about things differently than I do, and that's really important when you are putting together a team is that you find people who think differently from you so that you all can troubleshoot things together, right? Absolutely. We're all different. Yes. Everybody We're in the space has different skills, <laughs> I think. Yeah, we all have different majors, and we're all very different. How many students do we have? Six students? I think we have six I students that are part-time, one full-time staff member, and myself, and then a bunch of affiliated staff and faculty who help out. Um, this right here in front of me, this is our tool bin. Thanks, Dylan. I'll give you a high five. This is our tool bin. You can see it's labeled. Um, there's even something here labeled oyster shuckers. That's what I call these things. Uh, we try to keep these out of the 3D printers area because we found that a lot of the students using our 3D printers were just like using these to just dig in the bed like this and you're getting a lot of destroyed beds. If you're not familiar with um, 3D printer beds, what you get is this nice flat PEI sheet right here. Um, you can purchase this, this uh, sticky sheet from 3M directly, uh, which we've learned you can buy them in bulk, but it's really kind of a pain to constantly be making sure that these beds are great as they degrade. Um, print quality degrades. Uh, this is one of our Lulzbots. This is a Lulzbot 5. Um, we recently acquired a lot of googly eyes. So you're going to see little faces all over the place. Uh, it's one of the things about the maker culture that's really important is allowing people to be themselves, feel themselves, and take advantage of what makes them feel like they belong. Um, in terms of identity, that's really important. 
a lot of people feel like they don't belong in a space like this. And my goal is to change that. So I'll talk a little bit more about that when I sit down after I'm done showing you around some of our equipment. As I said, because we're under construction, a lot of our equipment is under wraps. And that is because we do not know how the grinding dust of that glue and flooring material that we showed you earlier is going to affect any of our equipment. But while we're over here, I'm going to show you this bullet. Does anyone know what this is? It's from Super Mario Brothers. It's really heavy. Um, it's Bullet Jim, I think it's called. Bullet Bill. Good job, Jamie. <laughs> so this is extremely heavy, and they 3D printed it. It actually screws and unscrews, but I can't show you that right now. Um, some of the students that work here like to try to print things that are as large and as heavy as possible. They really try to explore the depths of what can be done. Um, and I really appreciate that. Um, but back to this, there's a lot of hand tools, glue guns, glue sticks, drills, very exciting Dremel tools, digital calipers, vacuum attachments, batteries, clay sculpting stuff. This thing, which if you do 3D printing and you don't have this, I highly recommend it. It's called the Rotoko. Um, it's a sculpting and retouching tool, so it does post-processing. As you can see, it does blending, refining, cutting, and carving. It's like a cross between a glue gun and a Dremel. It um, allows you to repair your 3D prints so that if something didn't quite turn out perfectly, you can fix it. Uh, we have a few soldering stations. Here's a couple. Here's one. And then the other one is actually through the glass out that way. I don't know if you can see it, but we'll walk out there in a second. Um, air quality is really important to me personally, and so making sure that we have adequate ventilation and things that suck the smoke and filter it, that's number one for me here, is keeping everybody safe. Especially me, since I'm going to be working here for a long time. And now you're seeing kind of the mess. Um, keep in mind that we are being shoved into this room, so everything is a little bit messy. There's a, a desktop milling station that we use. This carves things out of other things. This is the Carbide 3D. Um, people love this. You can decorate boxes, make gifts for your mom. It's really beautiful. It carves things out of wood, bamboo, aluminum, everything. Um, this item is a 3D printed item. I'm kind of scared to touch it because sometimes I break it. But this is an air raid siren. I don't know if you can hear that. All of this was 3D printed. It actually gets to be quite loud. It's kind of a cool, kind of cool thing. Um, another thing that one of our students 3D printed and built is this uh, keyboard. I'm afraid that if I try to turn it on, I'm going to break it, so I'm not going to. But you can see it's in the blue and orange colors. It's been customized. It says Boise on it. It's a little keyboard, and when you press the keys, it makes sound. Um, they built it from scratch. They 3D printed it, and they soldered everything together. It's really kind of cool. We have a lot of Arduinos, Makey Makeys, robots of all kinds, um, all kinds of filament. We had this on back order for a very long time, the glitter filament. This is my favorite thing. You all need to have glitter filament in your maker spaces. It's called Glitter Flake Stardust. My actual favorite thing to do isn't 3D printing bees, but 3D printing glitter bees. Now that I'm excited about. Um, so as Dylan said, there are um, all kinds of 3D printers that are all currently under cover. <laughs> This is what happens when you transition spaces, just so you know. Um, this was our first 3D printer, which now is kind of like, it's over here. Um, we talk about using it, and instead we just kind of use it for parts so it sticks around. Um, all of the stuff that's in this room is materials that don't belong to us, uh, but belong to a different program who's also under construction at this time. And when they vacate this in three weeks, we acquire this room. This is going to be the final destination for the makerspace. Um, it essentially is going to triple our footprint, so we're going to have about 2,500 square feet total, um, which isn't its own building, but it's pretty great. Um, and we'll actually be able to run exhaust out through these walls 
these walls are um, down here. It's a little bit cheaply made. This is not, this can be knocked out pretty easily. And we can run a fume hood out these windows and we can actually open these windows. Whereas in the past, we've been more or less confined uh, to a space without windows and a space without exhaust. I don't know if you can see over here, but we have a view um, of the river and the park and the bridge across the street. So this is a really good spot for us to be in while also remaining in the center of campus where students want to find us. Okay, something I didn't show you is the sewing machines. There's a lot of sewing, knitting, and crafting. We always are talking about how everything is making. And when people come in here for the first time, we often ask them what the last thing was that they made. We talk about that. Um, baking cookies. Um, making ramen, all of that counts in terms of making, and we like people to sort of talk about those things to try to extend the definition of what making is. And that's how I get them to do some of these incredibly complicated things that no one thought they'd be able to do, like build a giant hang printer. If you Google hang printer, you'll find that they were invented in Europe. There's not very many of them in the United States that I'm aware of. Um, it's super cool that we're designing them for people to use here in the space. Uh, the, reason for building these isn't for the sake of having them. The theory is that they'll be able to solve like a housing crisis by being able to 3D print different parts that go into housing. So the student whose primary role in building these wants to bring them to other countries to help build houses for people in need, if that makes sense. We're going to go back outside real quick. I'm still very glad that you all can't hear that sound. Here's some of our students and staff all chatting together. We're semi-closed right now because of the construction. But I did want to come over here and show you real quick what this, this is the frame for the next version of the hang printer that Chris is working on. Um, and now I'm going to go sit down actually and talk to you all about some other things. Um, one of the things I'm not showing you right now is our multimedia studio, which is sort of a part of the makerspace. I'm about to get some interesting feedback. See, now you can see me in two places. Let me turn this one off and sit down. And in the meantime, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box again um, about what Amy has talked about thus far. And we'll ask. No? Yes? Oh, good. Okay. Yep. So one of the things we didn't um, talk about was the multimedia studio, which has been built around the corner. We use the Penn State model. It's called the One Button Studio. And I was able to acquire that funding on campus so that we could, um, we could build that available for everybody on campus here within the library. It's really beautiful. Um, I just don't have enough battery life at this time on my phone to walk over there and walk back. So, or time. I don't think I have time or battery life on my phone. Did you have questions first before I jump in and talk about other things? Nobody has typed in anything yet. Oh, here we go. Jamie has a question, which you can probably see. So, how do I prioritize equipment purchases? Is that the question? That's going to be a fun. Yes, one. that's it. How do I prioritize them? So it's really not up to me. Let's just start there. <laughs> um, I have a list. It's, the list starts with uh, the request wish list. The makerspace exists both in a physical space and a virtual space. So virtually, we use a Slack channel. Um, I hope you're all kind of familiar with Slack. And uh, the Slack channel is where all of the users of the makerspace have informal conversations. It's kind of like the couch, but online. So imagine sitting down on a couch talking about ideas. When they generate an idea, and they're like, we really need the library to procure this item, this piece of equipment. They put that into the um, Slack channel area for equipment requests. And then I add it to a massive spreadsheet that I have, and I count literally how many times an item gets requested, right? And I track, is it students, staff, or faculty that are requesting that? Um, at some point, I kind of analyze the urgency behind them, the cost behind them. I, I request quotes for all of those items. Um, 
I determine what that product is going to allow people to do or not do. Um, how is it actually going to benefit the student's learning process? I, I have a pretty extensive rubric that I use with criteria to determine whether or not something is going to be worth even fighting for. I don't have a budget. I'm not handed a budget. So then I have to go out and find, it, find funding, right? So that is sometimes because someone really cares about it and they're like, yeah, I want to fund more 3D printers for you. Um, I think we only really funded the first five 3D printers and I think we have about five or six additional ones that people have given us and then we've built other 3D printers and all of that funding doesn't come from the library budget. So right now we're currently in the process of requesting a donor to donate a laser cutter to us um, and we're also working with a donor who wants to build a giant idea board with us. So they want to have a place where people can discuss ideas. How do they save ideas and, and make ideas larger? They're thinking about building some kind of really neat interactive light up whiteboard, if you can imagine. Um, and this donor in particular also wants to offer workshops on how to obtain patents. So we work with everybody. The soldering equipment we did not purchase for the most part. The library purchased some soldering equipment, but for the most part it's donated to us. A lot of the robot parts were purchased um, by the theater uh, association and computer science. There's a class that generates funding. Um, so there's a class that I teach and the, we use this thing here called Bronco Budget 2.0 and the funding that comes in from that class goes into the equipment decisions. So that's how, uh, that's how we decide. The students have a lot of say and sway in the purchasing of the equipment. So what they want to have happen kind of comes first. I hope that answers your question. It's probably way too long. And if it doesn't, Jamie, I think you know how to get in touch with me. We can talk anytime. Um, if not, you all can, here's my email address. You can give me a call. So some of the things I didn't talk about were how many people we partner with, like the College of Engineering, a group called CTAP, uh, the New Product Development Lab, the Theater Association, College of Innovation and Design. We work with all of these different entities, both on campus and off, in order to really have the best possible service for our students. Our primary audience is students, um, students, staff, and faculty on campus. A secondary group is the schools in town. They are always asking us to come in to their school or have a field trip from their school here. And we do that because it's part of the pipeline of what I, I see as a pipeline of information literacy. Um, we're helping people learn how to get information, get digitally uh, fluent, and then create their own new information. They're building and inventing new things. And so if a fourth grader comes in here and they have this great time working with me and my students, um, chances are they're gonna feel passionate about their ideas, maybe eventually come to Boise State, at least have considered going to college and what college can offer to them. Um, and they'll start thinking about things a little bit differently. We try to empower them. And then the third group that we work with is the general Boise State community. We get a lot of requests from them to print things, 3D print things or build things for people. And we generally don't do that. Although starting now, we officially are allowed to charge for things. So we're gonna be sending out invoices to folks so that they can, um, they can pay for us to do so. Uh, we only have, we can only encumber about three prints from outside each week. There's about 50 to 100 prints going on every week in our space, just on the 3D printers, um, even during the summer, even now. Um, and that can get a little intense. We don't really have any room or space for the community to come in, uh, which is why now we're going to start charging folks. I need to pull up a document that has kind of our mission and vision so that I can start sort of explaining um, a couple more things about what we do. Just to want to make sure I didn't miss something. Cool. Amy, how much time while you're pulling it up? Um, so you have your hours 11 to 6. How much time would you say there are courses taking place in there versus sort of open hour space? Or is it always open? It's always so if you work in the space or you volunteer as a coach in the space, you can book time outside of the hours of 11 to 6. And that means the library is open from 7 a.m. until midnight, seven days a week. So the students and the staff and the faculty who work in the space, they can use all of the equipment outside of that 11 to 6. 11 a.m. till 6 p.m., we guarantee you're going to get help, right? 
So that's what we mean by open hours. So we just tell everyone, yeah, we're open then. Technically, we're always open. There's no wall, there's no lock. Um, anyone can walk in. Uh, but in terms of expectation management, we say, we're only open these hours, Monday through Friday, 11 till six, and that's when we have at least three people working at all times where they can come in and get help for them, from them on anyone. Um, in terms of like how much time is spent, the classes tend to be taught in the classroom that's kind of off to my right, right there. So that door goes into a separate classroom. So we tend to teach in that room, not in the space that where all the equipment is. So what we'll do is we'll drag things into the classroom, train them, and then move things back. And we book all of that time um, whenever we do that on the booking software that we use. We used to print things for people and that became really awful really fast. Um, we were getting 44 requests to print things each week. So that resulted in a backlog. 44 requests per week is um, at least two hours per print, at least 88 hours per week of just setting up prints and taking them off the bed, let alone having conversations with the people who are requesting the prints and talking about which settings they wanna use. And that's why we switched from the mediated model to the self-service model. So now we just train people really fast and get them on all the equipment and then help them and we coach them and we ask coaching questions. Um, so any of those people who wanna use the space, 7 a.m. to midnight, if they volunteer time, they can also use it anytime. Um, so I hope that makes sense. We want to empower them to help each other. Yep. It's really, it, that's, the, that's the crux of what we do, of our maker culture. Did I answer your question, Erica? Yes, you did. Sweet. So our vision is that our Boise State students are going to be confident creators. And to me, that means that they can make something from start to finish, regardless of the medium. They create prototypes, ideas, business models, products, code, files, video, podcasts, parts. And of course, the most important thing that they make is friends. Um, a lot of what I think uh, helps out with retention is that they meet people that are just like them. Uh, I was describing to the head of counseling services here at the university that the makerspace here is kind of like a dorm, but for all the people who don't have support any other place and uh, live off of campus, and have all kinds of different problems and they come together here in the space and they discuss them. Um, now I was reaching out to the head of counseling services for a reason is that we hear a lot of those conversations and we don't always know how best to intervene to get them help. And so uh, while we work on our own internal bias so that we're serving everybody equitably, we are also now focusing on uh, delivering trauma informed services so that we're not harming people further if they have been harmed and they've come here to find a really healthy community. And also how to know uh, when somebody really needs mental health, health help, right? How do we help them best? So we consider ourselves to be a radically inclusive community and we're a pipeline to fabrication resources all over the, the campus. So we do a lot of referrals out. We have innovative tools and emerging technology, as you know, and there's a constant design loop where they're thinking about stuff. Um, I don't care that people know a lot. Like, it's great if people are like, yeah, I'm an expert on coding and Arduino and building. That doesn't matter to me though. What matters is that they start somewhere and they move up a little bit. So we try not to pretend like we're the experts on things. As soon as people start doing that, um, it's not like we shut them down, but like we, we train them on how to ask coaching questions rather than like, professing to be the absolute expert on all things. Um, the most important thing I've learned in this space is that I'll be like, oh, that's not possible, you can't do that. But then I turn around and literally somebody has figured out how to do it. So I try not to be an expert, if that makes sense. Um, we do 3D printing, 3D design, CAD instruction, robotics, hand tools, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, little microcomputers, video, audio, vinyl cutting, knitting, crafts, cooking, coding, sewing. Those are kind of the basics of what we offer here. And uh, let's see, we have, so the main strategies for that is that maker culture I've been talking about, working on implicit bias training. I have a makerspace engagement model of how I move people up when they first come in and how I get them, how I get them to what I perceive to be an expert. Um, they, how they engage with us and how they interact with us. So I kind of have tabs on where everybody's at. And of course we have this coach program I've mentioned where people can volunteer in the space, they get trained and they get privileged access. Um, I'm gonna share with you our training program, because you might find that interesting.
And then we have this, the class that I teach and we do assessment about all of those to see how it's working. Um, the last thing I haven't mentioned yet is how we do strategic outreach is we look at the demographics of who's using this space and then we identify gaps and then we seek out individuals from those communities and bring them in. And those demographics can be everything from um, gender to uh, major, right, and everything in between. Uh, so we work really hard to make sure that we're an equitable space that provides a really rich so social community. I feel like I may have talked very fast and very quickly, so please stop me. Let me know what questions you have. I'm going to mute myself real quick. So yeah, anyone um, who has questions can definitely unmute, come on into the conversation. Usually at the bottom um, of Zoom, you have a little mute microphone, so you can click on that. Um, and unmute yourself if you have questions at this time. Otherwise, in a second, I'll continue to ask questions. Or type them in if you want to use the chat box. I will say that I've noticed I've gotten more progressively out of breath since I walked in the door <laughs> and finished this up. So I um, will most likely not be in this space for the rest of the day. I have asthma and I think we're not realizing how bad the dust actually, it's pretty bad. Oh man. Yeah. So I'm going to be leaving. This is like, <laughs> this might be all I do in this space this week. <laughs> so Amy, while I'm, I'm online and while I haven't gotten any other questions, I'm just curious about um, being, I had mentioned this earlier, but being a space in transition, um, what got, it sounds like funding is kind of limited, which is similar. I'm also at a public institution. Um, so I'm curious about all this documentation work that you've done and if that's helped you advocate towards getting this bigger space and moving in a new, you know, sort of encouraging making across the board on campus because it also sounds like you're reaching out to communities that might not make. And maybe you can also talk about some of the projects or people that have run brought into the space that might not otherwise, or you might not have known would have found the space otherwise if you had not done that outreach. Um, just because we, yes. we have some interesting stories happening here now with communities that I wouldn't have oh, good. Thunk would be the first advocates for making. Um, good. So it's just exciting to see what's happening here. I'd love to hear what's happening next. So four years, oh my God, no, longer ago, God. So when I, I first started talking about makerspaces with Nate Hill and Todd Colgrove, that was 2012. So I guess that was five and a half years ago at Internet Librarian, the conference in Monterey. Um, the criticism early on 2012 and 2013 about makerspaces and libraries was that it caters to a high socio, typically high socioeconomic status individuals who expect these kinds of services. Um, what I found is that actually um, we are the most diverse place on campus, period, end of story. Um, so we're gonna start with that. Uh, one of the most exciting um, things that's happened here in this space is a student named Donovan Kay. I had the chance of working with him last week. He, is, he was working facilitating a design thinking exercise for the whole campus with all the campus leaders. He's working in two different libraries now. He hasn't graduated, he's still, he's still a struggling student. He needs to come back and finish a few classes. Um, but he said he had failed out of high school and got his GED, never thought he'd go anywhere in higher ed, never thought he'd go anywhere with academia. And um, what he found, he had an idea he wanted to solve and he found us. And he said that the most important thing we did was we were excited about his idea. Here was his idea. He was TAing a psychology statistics class and he said he had to work with a student who was visually impaired and said, you know, I don't know how to do this. Um, we can't just use lentils on a piece of cardboard. They were literally gluing lentils onto a piece of cardboard to help the student understand what was being presented on the whiteboard in the front of class. And he said, I've heard of this thing called 3D printing. Let me go see if I can do that. And uh, he has a video, there's a video about him describing this whole process, which I'm gonna plunk in here for you so that I'm not, I'm not speaking for him. He's also speaking for himself here, and I would encourage you to watch this because it's really inspiring. He ended up uh, creating this prototype for the students so that they could physically feel the normal distribution curve in their psychology statistics class. And now that professor has learned how to do 3D printing and 3D design 
And now that professor is spearheading the initiative in terms of research on um, designing teaching aids for people with disabilities, specifically those who are visually impaired. This, this professor um, has psychology as their research area, so they understand how brain perception works. So they know what's physically happening in the brain when an individual touches something, right? So that means they can design something that is gonna help people learn better based on how they physically print it on the 3D printer. And they're pairing with one of our librarians, Dina Brown, who is um, an exquisite librarian and works a lot in the makerspace to run a program. It's gonna be a class where the students are going to design products for people with disabilities and visually impaired folks. Um, and that's gonna keep growing. We're now the research hub for that in the country. Um, another one of my favorite stories is uh, Amanda Bashnagel. She is a theater major. She helped build the space from the ground up. She started working with us in 2010. Um, she's gone on to start her own theater festivals. Um, a lot of that has been because of the work that she did here. And she learned how to do things from start to finish. And that's what I hear from a lot of the startup companies in town. Um, Boise's becoming kind of a tech hub got a lot of new companies they don't want people who know the theoretical side of computer science they want people they want to hire graduates that know how to build something from start to finish um, whether that's a web app like they're finding computer science majors don't know how to build like a website right so it doesn't matter what major you are you can be a marketing major you can be an art major and um, what's fascinating is you know Amanda was a theater major she worked here in the space the whole time she was working she learned how to do 3D printing, 3D design, video, audio, coding, everything, and the design thinking framework, and has started her own company, which is pretty outstanding. Um, Ollie Shannon is another student, and I could go on for days. <laughs> um, last one. Uh, they are working on um, using anthropology to understand gender and how to teach people bias using anthropological tools. And so Ollie has now been hired, but also, they come with this huge background in anthropology. They know how to do flint napping. Um, so I never would have thought I was going to learn how to smash open geodes here in the makerspace, but that's something that we do. Uh, we'll take rock hammers, go for a walk along the green belt, along the river, identifying nat native plants, talking about their uses, and learn how to like physically make cordage out of what's here along the river. Um, and then back to your other question, Erica, which is a little bit about how funding is tight. How have I been able to advocate? Um, I would say that I'm just barely hitting, um, I think I'm just barely hitting my point here with like all the documentation that I've done of getting the funding coming in. It's just starting to come in now, right? And the trick is that with makerspaces, it's gonna be outside donors that really wanna fund this space. It's not necessarily going to come from a tech fee or a library budget it's um, you can I would highly recommend that everybody look at what's being used in your libraries because our makerspace is being used a lot right and this is the new this is what we're doing this is new librarianship it's content creation what our David Lankus is referring to when he's saying that librarians and library workers are going to become people who facilitate content creation in their communities um, this is part of it so I would encourage all folks in libraries to look at what they're doing and identify areas where they can uh, cut and redirect funding. We've done some of that, so we have a more robust budget now. Um, we probably spend between thirty and fifty thousand dollars a year in terms of um, student staffing and supplies, and then we also get a lot of things from other people. So, um, but we're we're huge. I consider us to be huge in the in the scheme of things. Um, having about 700 people actively using the space is not the norm for most maker spaces. But the more that I tell that story, the more funding comes our way. Um, the more I publish on it, the more um, kind of exciting, like the more stories come out and start going places, the more funding rolls in. It's slow, but change doesn't happen quickly. And uh, if you take a look at what the University of Nevada Reno did, they talk a lot about that too. They've been around for just a year longer than us, and everything that they get in coming in now is based on donors supplying the funding for it. I hope that answers your question. Oh yeah, I, that is awesome. <laughs> I want everyone to be patient. It's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's really important to hear that too, because as someone also who started in uh, Makerspaces back in 2013, 
Um, change is slow, but it does happen. <laughs> and I've seen maker spaces in various iterations and sort of step back the last two years and I'm seeing the process of a build of a space. Um, and it's taken us two years to even get to the point where we have an empty room and a table in it. So um, I agree with that. That's cool. Any other questions before we have about nine minutes left before we hit two o'clock? And if um, I'm going to shut up for a second and see if anyone else wants to talk. One final thing I want to share before you all go is remember that libraries, the Library of Alexandria was the birthplace of information. It was the birthplace of ideas. People came there not to just like read books for fun. They came there to make things. So when you're talking about maker spaces and the purpose and the need to have them, remember the mission of librarians is to improve society through facilitating that knowledge creation, right? That's literally what we're here for. It's social good, making things better for people. So um, thank you for inviting me, Erica, to our joint project. I probably wouldn't have done it otherwise, but thank you. And I want to say I appreciate you all for um, tolerating. I'm so glad you can't hear the sound, but like for tolerating us under construction. I will post photos when we're all done so that everybody can see how glamorous we are. Um, but it's also really good for you all to see what it can be like. It can be a total mess and everything can be in total and complete chaos. And that is okay. We are using the time um, to work on projects and also get out of our space and visit other spaces. So yeah, and if you are trying to start a space and you haven't done that yet, if you haven't visited other maker spaces, go out and tour all of them because it's, it's really useful. You'll find your niche. Niche, niche. Thank you all. Thanks, Erica. Thank you, Amy. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, yes, as I said, this will be posted on our YouTube shortly. Um, and stay tuned. We're trying to organize. Oh, I got a yeah, smiley face. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Margo, for writing in. Um, and thank you, Anne. Um, I think this was a great introduction. It's the first hang printer I've seen in a space, which was really exciting. I have read about them and thought about making one myself and realized what a project it would be without the resources or um, support to make it. So that was really cool. Um, and if anyone has questions, you know where to find us. You can always post a question in the Google group. Mm -hmm. And with that, I will let everyone go and, and enjoy the rest of this uh, wonderful open invitation you can come visit and help us build a hang printer <laughs> i would love to yeah. that is like my dream right now because yeah, i'm following what they're doing maker vacations yes. hashtag maker vacations. <laughs> hashtag maker vacations. <laughs> all right i'll see you all, all right. later thank you bye bye